Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning, Pastor Rob. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my Amen. mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Okay, let's recite... Uh, today we're doing confession, and as a, our Lutheran Confessions put it, the reason we retain confession in the church is for the sake of the absolution. That's the reason we do it, because confession of itself uh, only gets us so far. There's, a, there's an old joke that psychological therapy is often called all confession but no absolution. Whereas in the church, we confess our sins and talk about our failings, but then we also can be confident that God, for the sake of Jesus' death and righteousness, will forgive us. So, let's say, what is confession? Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins. And second, that we receive absolution, that is, forgiveness, from the pastor as from God himself. Not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. Now we'll do the musical part. What is confession? Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The pastors act, act as representatives. All right, we act as representatives. But now, go ahead, Sam. God gave the text of the authority to, um, to forgive people's sins. Yeah. Sure. He, gave, he gave the church the authority to forgive and retain sins, so he gave us the office of the keys. And then the pastor is called by the congregation to exercise this office publicly. But then each of us also exercises the office of the keys privately towards each other when one of us sins against another and they say, I'm sorry, you say, I forgive you. And that forgiveness comes from Christ as well. But for the sake of our consciences being clear, God has given the church the office of the keys so that pastors can speak in, in his stead. And as we see on the Sunday after Easter, well, on, on uh, Easter, on, in John chapter 20, uh, the Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, or retain. As we, we'll, we'll talk about when we get to the office of the keys. But that's the reason pastors can say those things. The forgiveness comes from Christ. The righteousness comes from Christ. But it needs to be spoken. God, uh, people here need to hear it for the sake of our consciences. Now, what sins should we confess? Before God, that is, in our prayers, we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we are not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. We don't say, forgive me the trespass of uh, sinning, uh, disobeying my mom and dad, right? That's not in the Lord's Prayer. Instead, we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Even the sins we don't remember we're not aware of, we're asking God to forgive us in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. Okay, now this reveals that in the Catechism, it's talking about a very specific type of confession and absolution. What type of confession and absolution is this? Private, Private right? Private, before the pastor. In other words, in the presence of the pastor, you'd come to see him you would confess, forgive, you know, I'm, I'm asking God to forgive me for disobeying my parents, and so on. And then the pastor would speak the absolution correctly to you. 
Now, what we do in church is called general confession and absolution. And that's where we confess to God all of our sins and iniquities in a sort of general way. And then the pastor speaks the forgiveness back to us uh, so that we can have clear consciences, so that, that we're, we know that we're forgiven. But if we're really troubled by our sins and need to hear that spoken directly to us, we can go to the pastor and ask him, would you listen to my confession? And next week, we'll look at how individual confession and absolution is done in the church. Um, this week, we're going to talk more about self-examination and learning what sins we should confess. Okay, so let's do the song here. Consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker? Have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? Have you been hot-tempered, rude, or quarrelsome? Have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Have you stolen, been negligent, wasted anything, or done any harm? What would be another word we could use to consider your place in life? What would be another word for that? Vocation. vocation, exactly. So it's in within the context of our vocations, whether as a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, worker. Within the context of that, that's where we're going to commit our sins because we're going to step on other people's toes and we're going to fail to do our duty. And so that's why we examine our lives according to what the commandments say to us within each of those vocations. All right, let's do the song. for each of the commandments that we can use to examine ourselves, especially in preparation for going to private confession and absolution, or really, anytime we want to prepare for church, we can examine ourselves, uh, recognize our sins that we want to confess before God in our prayers, and before we come to church, and before we go to communion. All right, so a self-examination question, for example, would be, do I have the true God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as my only God. So what do you think? Can any of us answer that question uh, to say that, that it's true? Or is there a way in which this would not apply to us? 
I think it applies, right? We're baptized children of God. We've, we've come to believe in Jesus Christ and believe in the Holy Trinity. But then what would be a way in which it, we maybe don't always do this, live up to this? Well, I used to drive past a guy every morning when I was going from one church to the other church, and he was out washing and shining his car every Sunday morning. Uh-huh. And of course, I was judgmental uh -huh. and said, here this guy is on Sunday morning worshiping his car, mm -hmm. polishing it up just like it was a god. I don't know, he maybe was polishing it up to go to church. Maybe he was. <laughs> I didn't think that. Yeah. It was judgmental. So that was my nice. Yeah, right. But So the point would be that even as Christians who have been baptized and have the true God, we could slip up and start to put our faith in other things like mammon, things, things of this earth. So that could be a way in which maybe we fail at this, but we can still affirm that we do have the true God as our true God, as, as the trying God as our true God, because he has made us his children in baptism. So that, that one maybe doesn't apply to us as much, but what about this one? Do I fear, love, and trust in God above all other things? Hmm, yeah, so sometimes, I mean, we fear things in this life that we shouldn't fear because God has promised to take care of us. And so we shouldn't be afraid of death, for example, or injury. We don't need to be afraid of that. Um, we sometimes love, like that guy loved his car, sometimes we love create, created things more than we love the Creator. And sometimes we trust in ourselves and our own abilities uh, and things like that instead of putting our trust in God. What about this? Do I fear God's wrath and therefore avoid every sin? See, that's what the close of the commandments teaches, right? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his not wrath and not do anything against them. So instead, sometimes we tell ourselves, oh, God's... God's going to overlook that. Surely, surely he's not going to punish me for that, right? So that, that would be an example of something that we could confess, that we've, we haven't feared God's wrath and avoided sin because of that. What about this? Do I expect only good from God in every situation? Or do I worry, doubt, complain, or feel unfairly treated when things go wrong? Now, when things go wrong, what actually is God doing for us in our lives? Discipline. Disciplining us, right? He's disciplining us. He's trying to get us back on track so that we repent of our sins and turn to him for every good thing. He's disciplining us so that we learn to pray and ask for deliverance from difficult times. But as we learned in, in the, sixth, uh, the fifth petition, um, we, uh, we deserve nothing but punishment, right? And so even if we do get disciplined, we should never complain to, about it to each other. Um, we should never feel unfairly treated because we deserve nothing but punishment. But that's why we pray to God by grace to give us good things and bless us. Now, are we allowed to complain to God? This might be a little tricky. In prayer. Yeah, in prayer, right? So the Psalms teach us how long, O oh Lord, are you going to let this go on? So my, my basic policy is you can, you can in prayer complain to God, but you can't go and complain about God to other people. That, because that's then blaspheming his name. You're, you're, you're saying he's not being good to me right now. When in fact, Jesus says that you're blessed when you're persecuted, right? And when people revile you, those are blessings. So actually, we can embrace our sufferings and, and persecutions. Do I find the greatest joy? Uh, do I find the greatest joy in the the Father's uh, Creator's fatherly care and word and sacrament, or do I trust and delight more in the gifts of creation? In other words, Jesus says, "Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then everything else will be added to me." If I'm looking for the other things first and forgetting about Him, I've got my priorities out of order. Do I believe that God forgives me? takes care of me, and will never forsake me because of Jesus. Now this, this question is talking about despair. What is despair? Yeah, the loss of hope. 
And so if we lose hope and think that God has abandoned us, we're actually rejecting his word and promises because he's promised never to leave us or forsake us. So it's in our despair, our loss of hope in God, that we can actually see the weakness of our faith and our sin as well. Do I believe in myself, in my prayers, in my believing, in my good deeds, or anything else that I do above the Lord God? Mm. What does every Disney movie teach you to, teach you to do? Believe in yourself, Believe in yourself right? Yeah. And uh, so, tr so relying upon ourselves and on our own righteousness is always the wrong way to go. Remember the Pharisee and the tax collector? He gets up there and he says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like these other piggish sinners. Fast. And the Bible says he prayed to himself. Yes, he prayed about himself or to himself, really. It wasn't really a prayer, you know. He's bragging about himself. And the Pharisee, I mean, the tax collector just beats his breast and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus then says, the, the, the one who, who said, be merciful to me, goes home justified. That is declared righteous for the sake of Christ. Whereas the other guy is, is condemned. Dragged his sins with him home. He dragged his sins with him home. Our sins can either be on us or they can be on Jesus. And so in confession, we're loading our sins onto Jesus. And he, in absolution, is loading his righteousness onto us. All right, the second commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts lie or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. So, do I misuse the Lord's name? Do I curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name? Oh, how about this one? Do I call upon him in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks? Yes, Reverend. When people say, oh my God, mm -hmm. are they actually using God's name? Or would they have to use Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God? Well, this kind of gets to the next question here. Do I use God's name thoughtlessly or carelessly? Yeah. So, but I mean, what about when people say, Jesus Christ? Yeah. Right? Well, that's obvious. Yeah, that's obvious. But, but in, God in, is a generic term as it, well as... Uh, it is, but I mean, in the New Testament you, and, and in the Old Testament, you do see people addressing God. Oh, God... Right? Because that's the identity of the Lord of Israel and the triune God. So you do see that theos does mean it can be used as a personal address to God. But I mean, the question as to whether or not an unbeliever is using God's name in that case, uh, you know, when, he's, when he says, oh my God, I think he's just using God's name carelessly, even though he probably don't, might not even believe that there's a God. Well, it's amazing that since I'm retired and lazy, I've watched YouTube. And a lot of the things from watching uh, wildlife stuff or the say, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, you know, it just really it grates. It, well, and see, that's a good thing. When those things stick out to you and it grates your ears, that's a good thing because it, it's a signal to your conscience that something bad is going on, right? And so it should sound grating and, and, and off-putting to you. The good thing is, is I have never heard him misuse the name of Jesus. It's just God. Jesus. But a lot of people do. Yeah. How about this? The second commandment also deals with vows that we make in the name of the Lord. Such as baptismal vows, confirmation vows, marriage vows, legal vows. So those vows that we've made in the name of the Lord... We're, we're, we're asking him to witness the vow that we make and then to discipline us if we break those vows. So we could actually go through the list of vows that we make at confirmation and ask myself, have I kept those vows? We could go through the list of marriage vows and say, have I kept those vows? As a way of preparing, again, to confess specific sins against the second commandment. And then finally, uh, oh, and then do I make God's word and honoring God's name my highest priority in life? Right? What's the first petition of the Lord's Prayer? The first thing Jesus has us pray for. Hallowed be thy name. May your name be kept holy in my life and among us. Oh, here's one more. 
Am I diligent and sincere in my prayers, or have I been lazy, bored, or distracted? Pray without ceasing, the Bible says, right? All right, and then we'll just look at the third commandment, and then we'll, we'll close. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise, that is, avoid, reject preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. So do I hold the Lord's word sacred and gladly hear and learn it? Hmm. That's hard sometimes because God's law is part of his word, and I hear it and it reveals my sins and it makes me feel guilty. And so I don't like hearing that. But the gospel is what gives us the gladness. And, and it, can, it, can, it can then show us that God doesn't want to leave us under the law, but he wants to bring us under the gospel so we can be glad to, to read and study his scriptures and hear everything they teach. Do I neglect the gospel and sacraments or make light of them when they are given? Do I pray for my pastor and support his efforts to guard Christ's flock from error? I was gonna, that's the last one I'm going to do. Just as a reminder that everyone should pray for their pastor. And if the pastor has to make hard decisions about things that he has to deal with in the congregation, we need to be supportive of him, right? All right, let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you've revealed to us through your law, as we examine our lives according to the Ten Commandments, that we have failed miserably to keep them. Yet, for the sake of Christ who kept the law perfectly and fulfilled all righteousness, and then offered the once and for all sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, you'd promise us absolution, that is forgiveness, which you have graciously spoken to us through the mouth of the pastor and through the, the words of Holy, Holy Scripture and in baptism and Lord, the Lord's Supper. Help us to cherish this forgiveness so that we don't try to justify ourselves and defend ourselves and excuse our sins, but, be, but fess up to them and then be willing to uh, accept your forgiveness gladly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, so notice in this, we always pray each day that my doings in life may please you. How do we know how to please the Lord? First of all, by what? Right, so first of all, it's faith. Right? So once we have faith, then how do we know what works please Him? Consid consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Right? It's all tied together. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Alright, so our hymn today is Lord to you I make confession.
you all for uh, your good uh, questions and answers today. Next week we'll look at the, uh, the how-to of confession a little bit and sing another hymn about it.